Adam to If Not Us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sarah. I appreciate yeah. it. So just let's dive in. Uh, tell me about your background. Sure. So I'm an attorney by training um, and went to law school thinking I wanted to do public interest work. Um, while I was at law school, I got really interested in environmental law, uh, but decided to pursue a corporate route for a few years, um, focused on on doing environmental litigation, uh, partially, honestly, to pay back law school loans because because it was quite a, an expensive experience. Um, you know, and, and over my time doing environmental litigation, got kind of dissatisfied with the work, I guess is the right way to put it. Um, you know, helping companies do some of the things that they do uh, wasn't always particularly fulfilling or really the, the side of the fence that I come down on. Uh, and so was looking for another job. I've always had this interest in democracy and, and working on making sure that our electoral systems really work for people um, and not just the politicians. Uh, and so had an opportunity to, to, to pursue a job that combines both of those interests, right? So I'm, I'm a lawyer for a group that's helping um, pursue uh, democracy reform. And it's sort of just this, this ideal fit for me. And I'm, I'm really grateful to be in a role where I can use my skills to hopefully make a difference. Yeah. So uh, that sounds like a perfect fit. So um, what is the future that the Princeton Gerrymandering Project is trying to create? Yeah, so we're trying to do a couple different things, um, and, and I think you can see this in the different tools that we use as our project. Um, one thing is we really believe strongly in citizen engagement in dem democracy issues. Um, so the truth is that I think a lot of people feel very disconnected to the way that our government works. Um, they think that it's a group of politicians that don't really listen um, to individuals, voters about what they want. and. Uh, I think part of that is because the process of, of getting people into office is so opaque for a lot of people, right? Like the only thing they really see is election day and then the results coming out, right? Like, and they don't understand the rest of what's going on. Um, and so while our focus area for the past gosh, eight years now has been um, working on redistricting and sort of making that process really transparent for folks. So making data readily available, explaining what the process is, helping folks understand how they themselves can be engaged in it, and then putting out um, grades regarding a lot of these maps really quickly uh, so that citizens know exactly what politicians are up to. That's That's been our focus, right? But we're actually in the process, um, now that the redistricting cycle is starting to wrap up, of transitioning that approach to just a broad array of democracy reforms. So thinking about uh, how folks can understand and trust elections, right? Like there's been a lot of talk about election fraud. So right. like making sure we clarify when that, when that's a real issue and when it's not. Um, I think we're also looking at the information um, sort of ecosphere and the ways that like misinformation gets translated and how folks can vet that information. And then um, looking at other ways to make our democracy work better, whether it be ranked choice voting or maybe multi-member districts, like there's a lot of reforms that are on the table and sort of thinking through which of those are going to be the most effective. Um, I should say, you know, our, our team has a lot of data scientists on it. So we're, we take a very quant focus on these things. We use a lot of math and, and um, technology to develop answers. Um, but, but really the goal is to, for citizens to feel um, that their voice matters, um, that politicians are listening to them, and that they understand sort of how politicians are elected and how to get involved in the process themselves. Yeah, uh, y'all are tackling like the the big, the big scary stuff, like how to like, combat <laughs> yeah. misinformation is not a small, um, a small step. I, it's, um, people, I, I just, I don't, I'm personally completely puzzled as to how to uh, combat that. It's people believe what they want to believe in a lot of cases and like uh, facts don't always work. I'm, I fully support this because it takes good minds to to go to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, what, what you're saying is absolutely true is that people sort of have this bias towards um, whoever the people are that they trust telling them information and they don't really verify it. Like, they don't check behind the sources. Right. If, if it's someone that they. Um, feel support their political views, they're much more inclined to believe whatever's coming out of their mouths. Um, and, you know, I, th I think one of the things that we have found to be very effective in the redistricting space, and so we're hoping to apply it more broadly to other democracy issues, is ensuring that um, the voices that people hear reflect a spectrum of political views. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it, it, it's sort of unfortunate that right now democracy reform has become viewed as being solely a democratic issue that that only and, and by democratic i mean the democratic party not like small d democracy um that, that only the democratic party is really invested in these these ideas of election reform um when that, that's just not true actually uh so for example in utah um this past um 
redistricting cycle, they had an independent commission that was advocated for by Republicans and Democrats in the state. And, and the good government folks from across the spectrum were able to come together and agree on this reform as being a really important step um, in, in reforming their political system. And, and I think that there are good actors on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think making sure that people hear voices uh, of folks that they agree with saying that these are issues that we can all come together around is really an important step. It's hard. It's not easy. I mean, and it, it takes a lot of work um, to find those voices that are convincing, but they do exist. And I think it's really important that we do that work. Oh, I'm so. very excited to see how that works. That's going to be amazing. Um, so we kind of touched on this, but like, what are all of the barriers getting in the way of either the misinformation work or any sort of work with the redistricting? Um, what are the barriers you're running into? Yeah, well, I think they're they're constantly growing, which is probably an unfortunate yeah. reality of where we are right now. Um, you know, I think one is just a um, again the, the, the opacity of the the um, whole process, right? So so if folks often don't know who their um, elected officials are, mm -hmm. um, I think that you know people obviously have have a sense of who the president is often have a sense of who their senator are, maybe know who their congressperson is, but like kind of the lower down on the, the um, governmental level you're talking about, the less um, clued in people tend to be about who's representing them. And then that's sort of ignoring outside of elected officials, all of the government functions that are done by, you know, folks that are in public service. So whether they be um, working in government agencies or even just simple things like the folks that are serving as your election judges, right? Like who are working in the precincts, like people don't know how all of this process works. Right. And so I think that lack of information and lack of opacity is, is one major obstacle. I think the increased um, misinformation circulating is another huge obstacle uh, that um, we're trying to overcome. And then I think the the other thing that we're noticing, and it seems like it's been unfortunately trending in the wrong direction, is um, this flattening of polarization. Um, so it's just the case that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, if I knew someone's viewpoint on, let's say, gun control mm -hmm. legislation, so like, let's just pick an issue, that wouldn't necessarily actually tell me where they stood on an unrelated issue like abortion, let's right. say. So like two completely different issues mm -hmm. um, because there were folks that viewed those issues differently and, and, and came down on them in different ways. Uh, but what we're seeing is that there's a flattening of this partisanship where anyone's view on one topic is actually highly correlated to their view on just like a huge array of unrelated issues. Um, and it sort of drives people into these polar opposite camps, right? Like there's less room to compromise. There's less room to converse uh, with folks that are like-minded because you just don't view someone as being like-minded when literally every viewpoint of theirs is different than yours, right? Which, which makes sense. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's unreasonable. And so I think that is, that is just another obstacle that one of the things that our team is really thinking through is, is how do we, um, how do we expand that range of polarization such that people can hold nuanced views? Um, I think some of it is driven by the way that our election system is functioning. So, um, we obviously have, and a lot of states, what are, what are known as closed primaries, right, where only people that are registered members of a given political party have the ability to vote in a primary. Mm -hmm. But what that does is that drives politicians to the extremes. It drives people away from seeking compromise because that's what's rewarded in those those closed um, primary elections. And so, you know, one thing we've worked on is looking at whether an open primary would actually drive people more towards the center. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this new reform that's being looked at, and our, our team is potentially one of the groups that's looking at whether um, this new system of primaries where you'd have open primaries uh, and then in those open primaries, people from both parties would run and then the top four or top five candidates would then advance to the general. And then you'd have a ranked choice vote where everybody could vote one, two, three, four, five. I like this person most. I like this person least and see whether that would actually drive um, more moderate centrist candidates that are looking to actually represent constituents um, to the forefront, like whether that would drive away from this increased polarization and towards a more centrist view of um, politics. Right. I, I, again, I mean, we're quant. We'll see whether it works, yeah. but uh, it's interesting. It would also, I'd also be interested to see if that increased voter turnout for the folks that don't feel necessarily represented by those two extremes and would find a, a better candidate that rep better represents their views in the middle, if that was... Yeah, yeah, you would... You, right, you would, you would think so, right? Because, I mean, you do hear... Um, 
you know, when they do general election polling, just the number of voters who say, well, I don't really like either candidate. Mm -hmm. And that's often what you'll what you'll see. And so I, I think it is a really good point as to whether there will at least be um, increased voter satisfaction with who who's advancing. And then also if folks feel like there's somebody who represents their viewpoints, are they more likely to show up to a polling place? You, you would think yes. And we'll see where the numbers take us. Yeah. But. Oh, I love I love data. This is great. Um, so speaking of data, we uh, just 2020 was a census year. What exactly did you see? I know it was also a very complicated census year because of the pandemic, but um, how did that, did you, did your organization see anything interesting? Was there anything notable that came from that? Yeah. Well, one thing I always like to make a point of when we I talk to anybody about the census is I think that the Bureau did a really like remarkably good job given all of the obstacles that were in their way. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, it's a hard job to begin with to try to count every person in this country. Like that is not an easy ask. Uh, and to do so in the context of this pandemic, where like, honestly, when the, when the census really started, we didn't know anything about the virus. I mean, you have to remember how early that, that was really happening um, and that folks were really scared. And so the fact that they were able to drive any sort of reasonable count is just a tremendous accomplishment. So, so, Saying that, um, there, there, there nonetheless were maybe some things that, that we noticed that are, are questionable about the data. Mm -hmm. um, one is that it does appear there was probably a pretty substantial undercount of Latinos in this country. Um, and, and I think there's probably two reasons behind that. Uh, one is obviously probably most folks are aware there was significant controversy over whether there would be a, um, a question on the census regarding the citizenship status right. of individuals. Uh, and you, we're, we're fairly certain that, that that encouraged some Latino populations just not to respond to the census, right? Because they were very afraid that that question was still there, even though the Supreme Court had said it couldn't be, uh, and that that would somehow be used to, um, even if they themselves are are in the country, um, you know, authorized, that often you have relatives that aren't, right? That live in the same household as you, and you're afraid that somebody's going to get deported or, or, or what have you. So they were very afraid of the legal consequences for their families, which makes sense. The other reason that we think that there was a tremendous undercount in Latino populations is because of where the, the correlation of where growth in those populations is and who controlled the government at the time of the census mm -hmm. in those states. Um, so, for example, in Texas, where we know there's just been a huge boom in the, the Latino population, um, the Texas state government chose not to invest in census resources. They chose not to invest in um, really increasing their turnout and making sure that every um, every resident of the state was counted. Uh, and it's just an unfortunate reality that a lot of the states where there was large Latino growth also were states that chose not to invest in census outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's some reason to maybe potentially question the value of some of the data regarding Latino populations. Um, I think the other thing that, that our team was involved with some of this analysis when it was going on is the Census Bureau implement. This is going to get really nerdy. I apologize. No, I um, the Census Bureau implemented this new privacy regime mm -hmm. that was kind of new and, and, and very controversial. Um, so the, the Census Bureau has an obligation to make sure that individuals can't be um, uh, identified based on the census, the, the data that they release, right? right? So you, individual characteristics about um, someone shouldn't be discoverable by someone looking at Census Bureau data. And what was discovered following the 2010 census was that actually combining census data with publicly available um, commercial data that you can just purchase off the internet, you can actually re-identify like a huge percentage of the population. It's really scary um, and like very specific characteristics of, of individuals, um, which obviously has really profound implications if you're talking about um, individuals that are minorities in their community. Like if you can pinpoint with geographic specificity, specificity like this person lives in this house and they have this identity, that's a really scary reality, yeah. right? It's, it comes from, a, if, uh, if you have the reaction to it of like, oh, who cares? I don't care if people know where I live or uh, what my identity looks like. It, that comes from a very privileged place. And so to like understand that there are some folks that, uh, lots of folks, where that is a terrifying reality. Um, that uh, That's fascinating. I didn't know that that was uh, something that was going on. Yeah, I, I think really the only folks that we're paying attention to are like the data privacy nerds, which frankly, I am one now. Um, so uh, so the Census Bureau was trying this new method basically to obscure the data a little bit, um, which I, sh I should be clear, like the Census Bureau has always obscured the data slightly, again, to protect individual identities. I mean, it's not, that is 
not new. I think people think the census is um, absolute fact. That has never been the case. It has always done slight obscuring. Um, but again, like the, the methods that they used in prior decades have proven insufficient to really protect individuals. And so the Census Bureau tried this new algorithm. It's called differential privacy. Details aren't super important, but there were um, really profound concerns actually about the way the differential privacy was applied and whether it would have impact on minority populations and whether um, by kind of shifting slightly where those minority populations were um, were assigned or allocated in the census data, uh, that it would make it harder for redistrictors to draw districts in which minority populations could get adequate representation. Um, it, our study actually suggests that that's not as much of a concern as, as maybe some people were worried about because you have to get to really, really tiny population levels before it starts really mattering. And the size of our election districts are just bigger than those, those tiny, tiny census blocks. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a really interesting problem. And I think any researchers that are, are using census data, um, particularly if you're trying to get very granular, need to be really concerned about the ways the differential privacy are going to play out um, on whatever research you're trying to do. So it's, I mean, those are two things that we sort of yeah. noticed in the data this year. That's amazing. And uh, what sort of redistricting efforts, like as people have been submitting their new maps, um, have, have there been any trends? Like, I think that it's fair to say that a lot of uh, like big D Democrats would be kind of shouting for more like we're concerned, uh, but not sure if that's actually playing out as true or like how how things are shaking out. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of trends that I think are probably positive and a couple of trends that are probably negative. Um, so so positive trends, the public is significantly more engaged than they have been in prior cycles, which is great. Um, I think that again, talking about the opacity of the political process, um, redistricting was definitely one of those things that happened behind closed doors. Nobody really knew anything about it unless you were a political operative uh, and and people weren't paying attention. That is decidedly not the case this cycle. Um, the public is much more engaged. Um, I think, I think for two reasons. One, largely because of the overreach of a number of the political parties in the last cycle and folks sort of saw how abused this, the process can be mm -hmm. and they got engaged because there was a lot of press written about that. And then I think the other reason is that there, um, there are a lot of these technologies now that make it really easy for people to get involved. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are these websites like Dave's Redistricting, um, which was established by a former Microsoft engineer who just like in his free time uh, decided to build this mapping software that is phenomenal it's amazing it's like professional level mapping software but it's free on the internet for anyone to use that's amazing um yeah like incredible right uh and so i think the fact that it's so easy for people to get involved and so accessible now is just like really changing the game and people are people are doing that um i think some of the negative trends we're seeing right are um that so the technology right it kind of cuts two ways the, the other side of the technology advancing is that it is much easier for politicians to draw significantly worse maps. It's just, it's much easier for them to make really minor adjustments to lines to achieve very specific partisan outcomes um, in a way that we just hadn't been able to see before, right? Because like 10 years ago, a computer would take an hour to compute what the difference of moving a boundary two streets over would be. Mm -hmm. Now a computer can tell you in 10 seconds what that's gonna be. Yeah. And so they can just generate like hundreds and hundreds of maps really quickly saying like, oh, if we change this, if we change this, if we change this, like, what is this gonna mean? And of course, pick the like most significant partisan outliers they can, right? right. Um, that has then in turn led to two additional harms from our perspective. One is um, it looks like there's been a pretty significant decrease in the number of competitive districts okay. um, or districts that are sort of um, evenly split between the two parties, right. right? And that, to be fair, that happens every redistricting cycle. The parties draw maps that are going to favor their candidates. Um, but there's reason to believe because of increased technology that um, the the lack of competitiveness is going to be more sticky is what we call it this year. Like okay. it's going to be less likely to trend towards 50 over the decade. Right. Um, just because people are being so much more sophisticated mm -hmm. with the data that they're using. Um, the other thing that we're noticing, and this is a really unfortunate reality, is that uh, in a number of states, we're seeing minority populations really profoundly impacted by the way that lines are being drawn. Mm -hmm. um, so... I, I probably most folks know, but the Supreme Court sort of gutted the Voting Rights Act in the past decade in Shelby County, mm -hmm. um, and specifically how it related to redistricting, um, which makes it much easier for states to draw these lines that disenfranchise minority voters. And we are, we're seeing that play out. We're seeing um, the ways that lines are drawn um, 
are are taking away opportunity to elect districts for minority populations. So, for example, in North Carolina, um, there's this district that sort of hugs the coast um, that's been represented by this African-American congressman, G.K. Butterfield, for just decades. I mean, like he's, he's a long stay um, in the congressional community and they drew a district that's no longer majority black. Um, wow. And uh, it's like slightly under majority black, but also made sure that it had a Republican majority so that even if all of those black voters came together and voted um to, is for one candidate because it's a Republican majority district, it's probably not going to elect a black congressman. Right. Um, similarly, in Texas, we're seeing the disenfranchisement of Latino voters. Mm-hmm. It's kind of happening across the country, unfortunately. Um, and again, I think that the, the sophisticated technology that we have is just making it much easier for politicians to engage in these sort of um, abuses of these communities that really deserve representation. So yeah, oh, that's incredible. Um, so kind of shifting away from like the the nuts and bolts. Uh, and more towards like you as an individual. Um, what sort of things have you learned along the way? Like specifically, like, is there any advice that you would give to your younger self before like embarking on this where it's, you're getting a lot of information at times that's like not great and like how to not let that like just completely drag your mental health and like uh, envelop your world? Yeah, so I think one thing that I was really bad at early in my career and have increasingly been getting better at is just knowing when to unplug. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously during the redistricting cycle, things have been really busy. We've been working a lot of hours. It's been, it's been sort of crazy. Um, But I, you know, make a point of, um, I have two kids at home and during the hours that they're awake, I make sure that I'm not on my phone. I'm not on my computer. Like that time is precious. And I make sure that I have that family time. Um, Particularly like we have an eight month old, at home and like, you know, I mean, he's our, he's our second. And so I've seen how quickly that time can sort of flee. I mean, like, I can't quite fathom that my daughter's almost six. And so I'm trying to like soak up every moment with my, my littlest one right now, because I know it's going to feel like I'm going to turn around and he's going to be in school. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one thing that I've, I, you know, I really wish I had told myself earlier, like make sure you have those moments to unplug um, because it's frankly good for your mental health and you'll just feel better about your job. Um, I think the other thing that I really wish I had known when I was younger Um, is that relatively few people have a straight path, like straight trajectory for their careers. Um, That I think it's actually much more common for people to kind of zigzag and do different things that um, often feel very unrelated to one another, but like will ultimately potentially get you somewhere that you're really happy. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was like a math nerd in high school, but was also a violinist, right? So I'm like, I have this like really weird high school background, went to college, Um, majored in geography, which is like a really weird major, awesome, loved it, then went to law school because I didn't know what I was going to do with a geography degree, Um, ended up doing environmental law for a while um, and and litigating. Then I worked for a a couple of judges, uh, including for a bankruptcy judge, which is, again, like another like zig. And then zagged into um, working in house for a university. And like, if you put all this together and you look at it, you'd be like, what is he doing? Like, he has no path. And it's true, I didn't have a path. I had no clue what I was doing. I was just accreting experiences, right? Um, but it, they got me where I am. Right. Like, because I was a geography major, I'm comfortable with maps. And because I was a lawyer that worked with judges, when it came to convincing judges of the ills of partisan gerrymandering, like, I'm experienced with doing that. Like, I was in chambers during some of these cases. Uh, and then because I worked for a university, I'm very used to dealing with academics. I mean, I'm also married to one and that obviously helps as well. Um, I'm I'm used to their quirks. Uh, but it is, it's sort of this, like looking back now, I can see how all the pieces fit together. But at the time I, I felt like I was crazy. I felt like I was doing random stuff and I just wish I had had, um, more confidence to know that I was doing things that were going to put me in a place to be where I needed to be, even if it didn't feel at the time like I was doing that. Oh, so. that's beautiful. I think that's a really important thing uh, thing to share with folks because I'm in a similar boat. I didn't have the straight career path of like, oh man, like marketing and advertising is like always going to be what I want to do. I was in events. I did. Uh, I worked for the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau. So in Atlanta is a beautiful destination for all of your convention needs. And like, why am I here? Um, I, you know, but as you're there, you're like, sure, I think I can make a life doing this. And then you realize like, ah, this isn't really what I need. And then when you land where you're supposed to be, you can pick from all of those experiences to like make the most change that you possibly can. And that's, uh, there's something to be said for that. Cause the folks that are like, nope, this is what I'm doing. And they stick to it. That's great. Uh, but that is, 
I don't think the norm. Well, and I, I think society is still structured around this messaging that that's what you're supposed to do, right? Like that you're supposed to go to college, major in something and then pursue that as your career. And I, again, like great for the people who can do that. And I, and I, I certainly know folks that are, you know, have known since they were 12 that they wanted to be doctors and like they're great doctors now like that's amazing but i think it is also okay if that is not your trajectory i think particularly for millennials of which i am an elder millennial um i i think we change jobs a lot i think that's one of the characteristics of our generation and i think that that's okay i think we need to sort of re um reconceptualize of the ways that our careers can look and that it's um I think that's much more normal than people let themselves feel like it is. Oh, 100%. Oh, that's great. Um, so uh, moving forward with an eye to the future, um, if folks are listening to this and they're like, I want to learn more um, or I want to get more involved in my local democratic process, um, what should they do? Yeah. So if folks are particularly interested in gerrymandering, I would obviously recommend checking out our team's website, which is gerrymander.princeton.edu. So really easy to remember. Um, there's also some other websites that are really great. Um, there's a website called All About Redistricting, um, which has a lot of data and information. So like if you're whatever state you're in, they have a lot of um, uh information about the history of redistricting in your state, what the rules are, um, what the current maps look like, what they mean for you. So that's, that's a great resource. If you're interested in drawing maps, like I said, Dave's redistricting is a great place too. I, it sounds nerdy until you start doing it. It's kind of addictive to like sort of play with these communities. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just fun. Um, so those are on the redistricting side. If you're, if you're interested in sort of getting involved with your local community, um, you know, one place that I really recommend folks um, look at because they've just, they've got really tremendous organization across the country is the League of Women Voters. Mm -hmm. um, despite the name, it is not solely for women. Both men and women are, are in the organization and, and are part of leadership there. Um, their history is largely with, with women engaging in civics, but but that's, that's certainly not all of their membership. They are really a tremendous resource at the um, local and state level, just exactly how to get plugged into politics. Didn't they um, lead and, the, um, the, uh, the Independent Redistricting Council for Michigan? I think they were the ones that like led the charge to create that. They were one of the groups. Yeah. There was another group that actually um, called Voters Not Politicians that came together too yes. um, that did it. But I, I mean, and this is the thing is all of these groups work in coalition with one another. So there's mm -hmm. never, no organization can get it done by themselves, right? right. Like it, it, it takes a lot of people to make these changes. So they're a great place. And they'll also know folks that are working on whatever the issue is that you care about. Um, the other thing I feel like a lot of people were talking about this during 2020 leading up to the election because of COVID and the impact that it had on a lot of folks, but don't not still do things like volunteer to be an election poll worker, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, I, I work for our local precinct. They always need more people. They always need folks that are willing to volunteer and do that. Um, it's really sort of a critical part of our democracy to have these polls function. Um, and I know, <sighs> I know that it feels like that's really small potatoes. Like it feels like you're not really making a difference, but for like the people in your community to know that their precinct is going to function well is a really meaningful step. And if everyone across the country kind of stepped up and volunteered, it would really actually make a really big difference. Yeah. Um, so I don't think folks should undersell their ability to make a really profound difference in the democratic process. Um, so those are a couple ideas of the ways that folks can get involved. Um, you know, I also always encourage people to think about running for local office. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, we point to Congress and Senate and the presidency as like these big glamorous offices, whether everyone feels they're glamorous or not is maybe a, a separate <laughs> question. Um, but, you know, don't, don't underestimate the importance of your local school board or your city or town council. Um, those positions really matter. Um, and I think folks underestimate how much of the policy that impacts your day-to-day -day life is made at the local level. And so think about stepping up and volunteering or running for office, um, I just, I think people often think they're not qualified when they're way more qualified than they think they are. Right, so. uh, right. Um, and there are a lot of resources to help folks who are like, oh, I've never done this before. What should I do? Um, I know Run for Something is one of them. There are plenty of others that are uh, very active in down ballot races to uh, trying to boost folks' confidence to know that they are experts in uh, their, A, their lived experience, and B, that it's a title and you probably already know more than you think you do. Right, right. No, that's exactly right. And then to plug another organization that I'm part of that does similar work, although it's not specifically um, 
always training people to run for office. It's also folks that want to take up leadership roles. Um, but but leaning on the progressive side of things is the New Leaders Council. Oh, great. Um, they have chapters in cities really across the country, very much focused on training people sort of 40 and under, mm -hmm. although we do have folks that are a little bit older than that involved as well. Uh, and and it's a, a, a training institute that we do every spring. Um, actually, the I'm part of the Philly chapter leadership and our, our organization starting there. Um, their institute this weekend. So the, we've got a new cohort coming in, which is very exciting. I'm, I'm very glad to, to welcome them to the org, um, but it's a great organization that does really um, good training across the country for folks. Great, so. we will put all of the links in the show notes to this too, so people have like a very easy way to find all of these wonderful organizations. Um, so what is next for you, whether that is this weekend, uh, this month or this year, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, so uh, again, being a little nerdy, um, we are actually our uh, myself and, and one of our other team members are going to be teaching a course at Princeton um, this spring, which I'm super excited about. Sort of looking at uh, what we're calling bugs in democracy and the ways that students could get involved in fixing them, um, which is just I, it's it's really exciting for me to be sort of working with this like next generation of of people that are committed to um, continuing. Uh, making our democracy work in the ways that it should uh, and, and are really striving to do that. So that's that's really exciting. And then, um, you know, probably a lot of time with the kids. It's, yeah. you know, it's when we're recording this, it's MLK weekends coming up and we are expecting snow in Pennsylvania. So I'm sure there will be snowmen made with my kids and I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, so, that's going to so. be so cute. Um, that's great. Well, thank you so much for the, taking the time um, to talk about all of these things. And uh, I hope folks... Uh, learned a lot and got inspired and will uh, take action to learn more and get more involved. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, Sarah.